If you would, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. If you do not have the diagram of the tabernacle, raise your hand and we will get you one. Before we get started, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Great God and Father, we thank you so very much for another opportunity to open your word and study it. We pray to God that you'll bless us in our efforts to learn more about your will, to learn more about Christ. We pray to God that you'll help us to walk in the light each and every day of our life. We repent of our sins and we pray for forgiveness. Bless us as we strive to do your will. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we finished up Hebrews chapter 8 where the, the, uh, the main point of Hebrews 8 is that there is a new covenant that we are under today that was prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31 that would come. A new covenant that <clears throat> brings about a whole different system uh, of serving God. A totally different uh, system, a totally different law, and a complete fulfill, full, uh, forgiveness of sins and a complete fulfillment of all of the prophecies about Jesus Christ. All these things come together in Jesus, and Jesus, by His death, brings about this new covenant. Now, going through chapter 9, as we eventually get to these words, we're going to see the words covenant and testament used interchangeably. I looked it up in the original Greek, and it's the same word. Testament and covenant are the same word in Greek. Uh, We call it the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation. It can also be called the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. And so it's it's words that's used uh, in the same way, uh, coming from the the, uh, same uh, Greek word. And as uh, Hebrews chapter 8 ended, it talked about the new covenant. When he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, the first being the old covenant. That which is uh, becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to vanish away. And as we ended class last week, we pointed out the reason why he says it's ready to vanish away is because he's writing to Christians who were living before 70 A.D., before the destruction of the temple. So they would be very familiar with all the sacrifices and all the activity of the priest because the Jewish nation as a whole rejected Christ, yet there were a few Jewish people, the apostles, and and a few thousand Jewish people uh, that did accept Him and became the church. But the whole nation kind of ignored that and they continued on with their temple services. Well, he was an imposter, and they continued on with their sacrifices. Well, he says it's about about ready to vanish away. In other words, it's believed that this book was written before 70 A.D. That means within a few years, there's not going to be a temple anymore. In a few years, there's not going to be any priesthood. There's not going to be animal sacrifices. And another interesting thing is, all the records in Jerusalem in 70 A.D. were destroyed. There is not a Jewish person today that can prove to you that they are of any tribe of Judah, or any tribe of Israel, so to speak. They cannot tell you what tribe they're from. All those records were destroyed in 70 A.D. So the Jewish people today, they cannot prove their tribal identity. And it's, and it's meaningless anyway in the New Testament. Because neither Jew nor Greek, when it comes to Christianity, it don't matter. We're all one in Christ We all have the same need, salvation from sin, by one Savior in one church through one gospel. So it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or or, um, Eskimo. It don't matter. You need the same 
plan of salvation. So that concept of trying to have a Jewish identity, I mean, for cultural purposes, that's great, but religiously, it's a waste of time. Because following Christ is what matters. And that's the point that the Hebrews writer is trying to get across to these Hebrew people who were going back to the temple, going back to those animal sacrifices, and leaving Christianity, leaving Christ. He's saying, look, this is about to all vanish away. Christ is superior in every single way, and the New Testament is superior in every single way. That brings us to chapter 9, verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and earthly sanctuary. First covenant is referring to what? Law of Moses. Verse 2. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part of which was the lamp stand, the table of the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Verse 3. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, which uh, overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. I'm about the Ten Commandments. Verse 5, And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of which things we cannot now speak in detail. So he's talking about the arrangement of the tabernacle. It's very interesting that when you look on the chart, the Old Testament arrangement had the altar of incense uh, in the, the holy place. He mentions it here uh, as if in verse 4, that it was in the Holy of Holies uh, area. Uh, it may be because it was so closely associated with the Holy of Holies, he just kind of included it in that. It was right there next to the curtain. That's the, uh, or the partition there, the altar of incense. So uh, that would explain that. But when you go back and you read the original uh, in, in, in the book of Exodus, it talks about the arrangement of this furnishing within the tabernacle, which was basically a portable temple. They needed a portable temple because they needed to move. They were wandering. Later on, when they would get established in Jerusalem, God would have them build the temple through Solomon. David wanted to do it. God said, you're a man of war. you got blood on your hands. Your son Solomon will build my temple. So basically, the tabernacle was a portable temple. And therefore, it was to set up and to actually give us a picture of something that we're going to go back and we're going to look at in just a moment. Remember, in chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, they served as a copy and shadow of heavenly things, the tabernacle did. So they represent something to us in Christianity that we're going to see in just a moment. Now look at verse 6. Now when these things had thus been prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. That refers to this part here, the bigger area, the holy place. That's where the priest would go in and serve, where the showbread and the golden lampstand were. The priest would go in there and serve. Look at verse 7. But into the second part, the high priest went, Once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins who who were committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating that this way into the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So if you look on your chart there, where the altars of incense uh, is found, the altar there, there was a curtain, that division between the holy and the holiest of all, the high priest once a year went in to the holiest of all where the Ark of the Covenant was and the mercy seat that was above the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the, the, the only seat, so to speak, in the tabernacle was the mercy seat which represented the throne in the presence of God. And as I mentioned before, there was no seat for a priest to sit on because he was up serving he was up serving. The priest would serve in the holiest or the holy uh, pl- place where the showbread and the lampstand were. Then the high priest once a year would go behind that curtain where the Ark of the Covenant was with blood. 
which represented the atonement for the people. Now look at verse 9. It was symbolic. Now notice this. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience, concerned with foods and drinks, various washings and the fleshly ordinances, imposed until the time of reformation. Now verse time says the time of reformation. When is that? When did that take place? When Christ died, the time of Reformation, things are going to be different. Reform is what Reformation means. It's not going to be the old physical temple sacrifices. There's going to be a spiritual temple, the church. There's going to be spiritual sacrifices. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, where the church is the royal priesthood offering up spiritual sacrifices. Only going to be one high priest, Jesus Christ. So all that foreshadowed what we have now, the time of reformation. And so the time of change. Jesus talked about it like this, John 4, 23 and 24. When he talked talked to the woman of Samaria, he says, The time is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And it will not matter whether it's in Jerusalem or in this mountain, talking about Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans worshipped. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And that's referring to the time of Reformation, the time that we're living in now. So there were all kinds of food, drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances. Verse 10 is referring to the book of Leviticus. Just read that entire book and you'll find everything he's talking about in there. So we we see that he's talking about all of those activities the Levitical priests went through. Now notice, all of this were a foreshadowing. Chapter 8 and verse 5, they were symbolic of the present time. Uh, Hebrews 9 and verse 9. Now look, look at verse 11. But Christ came as a high priest of good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. Something spiritual now. Not, Not the copy, but the reality. Verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now let's stop right there. He's saying that everything that we find in the tabernacle has a New New Testament correspondence to it, so to speak. Now, let's see if we can match this up. Look at your chart. When you come in from the east, going westbound, into the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offerings. What was done there? Animal sacrifice was done there. What would that represent to us as Christians? The death of Christ. So as you enter into the courtyard of the tabernacle, you have the death of Christ. Without the death of Christ, there wouldn't be anything else. So the death of Christ represented by the altar of offering. Okay. The next thing you have is the the bronze laver, which was a basin of water where the priests would wash before they would go into the tabernacle holy place. What does water have to do with us? Baptism. John 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we have baptism there. You could be writing this down if you wanted to and kind of pointing out the altar of burnt offerings. That represents the death of Christ. The bronze laver, that represents baptism, being born again of water and the Spirit. When a person is baptized into Christ, what does God add them to? The church. After the priest was washed in the laver, they could go into the holy place. You see the holy place there? It has the uh, showbread. It has the golden lampstand. What did Jesus say in John chapter 6 that we had to eat if we had eternal life? What did we have to eat? Flesh. 
We had to eat something and drink something. We had to eat bread. We have to eat His flesh. He's the bread of life. We have to drink His blood. Not literally, of course. And that's not referring to the Lord's Supper. It's referring to ingesting Christ, bringing Christ into us, ingesting Him. He is the bread of life. Well, there you have the table of showbread. That's what the Christian does once they enter into the church. So the holy place there where the showbread is, the altar of incense, the golden lampstand, I believe that you can safely say, conclude logically, that refers to the church or the kingdom. Because before you get into the church, you have to be washed in water. Before you enter into Christ, you have to be washed in water. You have to be baptized into Christ, and the Lord adds you to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. That's where you function as a priest, within the church, as a Christian. Okay? The golden lampstand. Well, what would that represent to us as Christians? What did, what did Jesus say about light? He's the light of the world. What do you say about Christians? We let our light so shine. So light, uh, which represents uh, uh, being illuminated by God's Word, we know the Holy Spirit through the Word of God illuminates our minds as to what's right and what's wrong. We turn to the book. When we open this book up and we study it with the, with the intent of obeying it, it's turning on the light. And therefore, you have that lampstand there, light, to show us <clears throat> the altar of incense. What, is that, what would that represent for us as Christians? Prayers. You find that in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, I believe it is. Or it even symbolizes, it says, the golden bowl of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Prayers being offered up to God. So we don't burn literal incense. We offer up spiritual incense to God as our prayers. They would go into, the, the, the incense would go into, behind the veil, into the holiest of all. Now, if, <clears throat> if the holy place there where the showbread and the golden lampstand are, if that represents the church, then what would the holiest of all represent? I heard mumbling. Heaven. Heaven, because that's where the throne of God is. The presence of God was over the mercy seat. That's where the high priest would go in once with the blood of uh, the atonement. And therefore, we, we see a picture of, of New Testament Christianity uh, in the tabernacle. Now, this is a very condensed study of that. There's a little booklet I need to get a hold of to give to everyone in this class, that goes into a deeper, uh, detailed study of that. <clears throat> it's very interesting. And he gives all the scriptures that correlate with it. And I'll try to get that uh, as soon as possible. But that shows, and, and it starts with the death of Christ. It starts with the altar, then the water, then the holy, then the holy of holies. Yes? Mm-hmm. Very good point. That was the curtain that was in the, 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 the temple that was ripped from top to bottom. Very good point. And that was symbolic. That's, that didn't just happen just for, wow, that's neat. That had a point. That represented, through the death of Christ, He has opened up a way into heaven. That curtain was always there while the, New, while the Old Testament stood. And only the high priest could go in there. But that, that, uh, <clears throat> that curtain, I forgot the exact dimensions. It was very, very tall. Very, very tall curtain in that big old temple. And very thick material. It would take a whole lot to rip it. So it indicates that God did it because He did it from top to bottom. Again, those details. He ripped it from top to bottom. God came down here to reconcile us back to Him. Top to to bottom, rich with symbolism. So it, it indicated an opening up. Access can now be granted uh, to God through the death of Jesus Christ. 
And it's very interesting that when Jesus died, you can study this, the very hour that Jesus died was during the time of the Passover when the priest would be in the temple serving. So those priests witnessed not only the earthquake of that big old building shaking, but that veil ripping from top to bottom. And you read in the book of Acts, it says a great many of the priests obeyed the faith. You know why? They saw those signs in the temple when they were serving, when Christ was outside the wall being crucified. That's powerful. <clears throat> so all these things correlate. And notice, notice there's nothing without the death of Christ, the burnt offering. You can't get into the tabernacle without water baptism. You can't get into heaven outside the church. You can't serve Christ without the church. There's no such thing as solo Christianity. And only through the church, the Lord's church, can you get access to heaven. That's what this tabernacle all represents. And notice they didn't have a tabernacle of your choice. Go and worship in the tabernacle of your choice. And if you don't like it here, we'll rearrange the furniture to please you and your children. No, they didn't do it. It's either God's way or it's the wrong way. Same way with the church today. It's either God's church or it's the wrong church. And that's the access that we get <clears throat> through the sequence of events. And some people want to, they'll take the death of Christ. They don't want the water, but they want to get into the Holy of Holies. They want to bypass the church. and uh -uh. Clearly sets forth the order of which things have to be done. So we see here, Hebrews chapter 9, <clears throat> it's a tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation that He came. Not made with hands, that's very significant. That means the, the, the tabernacle of Moses, He used hands to make it. When the kingdom of Christ would be established in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar in the dream that he saw, it would be a, a, a rock that was brought out of a mountain made without hands. Talking about the kingdom was made without hands. In other words, God would do it. Jesus said in Matthew 16 and verse 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. God would do it. So it's not a tabernacle made with hands that is not of this creation. <clears throat> now look at verse 13, Hebrews 9 and verse 13. Well, back to verse 12. Not Jesus went into heaven, not with the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but with His own blood. He entered the most holy place, that's heaven, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Once for all. He didn't come back out. When He comes out at the end of time, it's not for salvation. We're going to see that at the end of this chapter. When He comes out of the Holy of Holies, when He returns, it's for judgment. He went in... And he has obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer and the sprinkling of the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How much more? Christ is better. His system is better. His system is the fulfillment of everything else that represented in the Old Testament. So it says there in verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ... Now I want you to notice all three persons of the Godhead in this verse. The one God and the three divine persons there. How much more shall the blood of Christ, God the Son, through the eternal Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, offer Himself without spot to God, God the Father. All three persons are involved in our redemption. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That goes back to that concept found in chapter 8 of complete forgiveness. Complete forgiveness. And once that sacrifice is sufficient, well, what if you sin again after you become a Christian? You repent, you confess your sins, you keep on walking in the light. You don't, there's not a need for another sacrifice. One sacrifice for all. Verse 15. 
For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may obtain the promises of the eternal inheritance. Verse 15 is, is very rich in so many areas. It says, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. What's a mediator? Go between. There's only one mediator. You look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Paul says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. One mediator. That means there's no mediator here upon the earth. As I've said before, the system of the priesthood within denominations, within Catholicism, Catholicism, is unscriptural. We don't have to go through the priest to do anything. These Catholics and and all these denominational priests are man-made. Every Christian is a priest. And therefore, we go through Jesus Christ, the only one mediator of the new covenant by means of death. That means his death was what produced it. He's going to go on to talk about that beginning in verse 16. But it's his death that produced the new covenant. That means when Jesus was on earth, he lived under what covenant? The old covenant, the first. He was bringing it to a close. And by his death, he would bring about the new one. So by, the, by his death, the mediator of a new covenant, by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. What's that referring to? Is that not referring to those who sacrificed and obeyed God under the old covenant that they would be redeemed by the blood of Christ? Not by the animal they were sacrificing, but what that blood represented. By what that blood represented. And the way that I describe this in verse 15 concerning How were the Old Testament saints saved? How were they forgiven? It's like this. A credit card. You go purchase something on a credit card. It may not be smart nowadays. But you go buy something on a credit card, you can take it out of the store and you say it's mine. But it hadn't been paid for yet. In the same way, the Old Testament saints, when they obeyed the covenant that they were under, whether it be the patriarchy or whether it be the law of Moses... When they did what God said with the animal sacrifices, they were forgiven. They had salvation. They were forgiven, but it wasn't paid for yet. The payment would come when Jesus died. So they could, and we can safely say they didn't understand this, but we can safely say they were saved by the blood of Christ. Noah didn't know that. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they didn't know that. They didn't understand it. They knew there was a promise coming Messiah, but they didn't fully understand that. We got the rest of the Bible to tell us. David didn't understand that. He he understood all those promises made to him that a descendant of his would come, that would rule, that would reign. And he he made prophecies about the death of Christ in the book of Psalms. He didn't fully understand that. And, And that's exactly what Peter says when he talks about those of the old covenant when they wrote by the Holy Spirit, they didn't fully understand what they were writing. Again, that's proof that they were inspired. God wasn't using their understanding. He was using them and their instrumentality to get His will put into Scripture. They didn't have to understand what they were writing. We do now because we have the new covenant in which we can see that's what that meant. That's what that meant. So everyone that's saved from the time of Adam to the, to the last person on earth that's saved will be saved by the blood of Christ. That's how powerful his sacrifice is. It went forward and backwards to take care of the sins of the whole world, going all the way back to Adam and going all the way to the end of time. And that's why... It was such a horrible thing for Christ to suffer that on the cross. The sins of the entire human race, of every human that ever existed, that ever sinned, were placed upon him.
And that's what's amazing about a sacrifice. It just took that. That's it. That those, verse 15, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. How are we called today? Through the Word, through the Gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. He doesn't call us in dreams. He doesn't, he doesn't throw things down in front of our path. He, he speaks to us in the Scriptures. That's how He calls us today. We're called by the Gospel. <clears throat> Any questions or comments before we go through verses 16 and 22? Yes. He went to paradise. He went to a realm that's called Hades. And in, in, in Hades, there are two areas. There's paradise, which is also called Abraham's bosom. And then there's torment. Luke chapter 16 deals with that. If you read what Jesus said there about the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus on the cross told the thief when he forgave him, today you will be with me in paradise. So when Jesus died, he, the thief, and everyone who dies, that's saved, they go to paradise. It's, it's the in-between place, the waiting room, spiritually speaking, between uh, now and the resurrection. Technically speaking, when a righteous person dies, they don't go to heaven. They will go to heaven, but they don't go to heaven when they die. They go to heaven after the judgment. Remember, when after Jesus was resurrected... He says, I have not yet ascended to my Father in heaven. When Mary came to, to, to talk to him, and, she, and he said to her, don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended to my Father in heaven. So after the resurrection is when we go to heaven. But between now and the resurrection, when we die, we go to paradise. Uh, it's a disembodied condition. I got a whole lesson on that. <laughs> Exactly. That's a great way of putting it. He did the same thing that we did. His spirit went to paradise. Then his spirit went back into his body. He was resurrected. His body was changed. He appeared on earth for about 40 days. Then he ascended back to the Father. That's a picture of what's going to happen to us minus the 40-day period. (laughs) The point of him appearing for 40 days was to teach the apostles further and to prove he was resurrected. So that's the the intermediate period is uh, between um, um, now and the resurrection when Christ returns. Yes. Well, it, it, he bound the devil by his death. There, there's nothing that says that when he went to Hades, he bound the devil. There's nothing in the Bible that says that, really. Okay. There, there, the, the confusion comes because of the King James Version, the 1611 English. They would translate Hades hell. And that's a problem because I want, since we're on this, um, look at Acts chapter 2. And I'll show you where the confusion comes in. Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> look at verse 27, Peter's preaching here, for you have not left my soul, this is talking about a prophecy about Christ, you did not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow the, your Holy One uh, to see corruption. If you have the King James Version, the 1611 Version, it says hell there. And that's an unfortunate translation because 
in our modern speech uh, way of saying hell, hell represents eternal punishment. In, in, in the 1611 period, hell could represent the afterlife or eternal punishment. And that's why those, the scholars would translate Hades, hell. But notice, if you have a newer version, like a New King James, New American Standard, or a newer version, it says, you will not leave my soul in Hades. Paradise is in Hades. And that word means the realm of the unseen. That's what it refers to. And it refers to where our unseen part goes. Our unseen spirit goes to that when the body dies. So his soul went in Hades. And his body did not see corruption or did not undergo, <clears throat> did not undergo decay. Yes. Hades and Sheol, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word Sheol, nine out of ten times it's referring to the same thing, but sometimes Sheol in the context in the, in the Old Testament can refer to the grave. But most of the time it refers to the same thing as Hades in the New Testament. Hades refers to that realm that everyone dies, they go to Hades. The righteous go to paradise in Hades. The lost go to torment in Hades. But when everyone dies, they go to Hades. It's that realm, that dimension of the spirit where people go. And so <clears throat> I'll do a lesson on that or recycle my lesson. I already did on it a few years ago on um, the afterlife pretty soon. And um, we can talk about that <clears throat> But that's a very good question because the misunderstanding comes from uh, the, the uh, King James Version. That's why I'm, I'm a big fan of the New King James. Because they say, see there, Jesus went to hell. That's what it says right there. Well, that's Hades in Greek. It's not hell the way we think of it. Yes. So if Hades is both torment and the right that just means that when He went, but he told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So he went to paradise in Hades. Right. There is a, there in Luke chapter 16, <clears throat> there, is a, there is a gulf or a separation between... Uh, Torment and paradise in Hades. The place Jesus went was paradise. But he still was in Hades. Just like if my wife calls me and, says, and I say, she says, where are you? I can say I'm in the church building. Well, I could be either in the auditorium or in my office. But I'm still correct in saying I'm in the church building. It's correct to say Jesus went to Hades but he didn't go to torment. He went to paradise. He's told the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. And then that's in Luke chapter 24, maybe 23. No. 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 <clears throat> in fact, Hades itself will be cast into hell. Again, technically speaking, there's no one in hell yet. It's awaiting the unrighteous. Look at Revelation <clears throat> chapter 20. This is after the judgment, of course, verse 11 and 12. The, the dead are judged. The, Death is conquered by the resurrection. The dead, small and great, stand before God. Look at verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. Well, that's hell. That's Gehenna in the Greek. Eternal punishment. This is the second death. Hades, that realm, will be emptied out and be destroyed. It has no other function. Because it's an intermediate state. When, when Christ comes again and resurrects all the dead he's going to take all those souls out of Hades both the righteous and the wicked that's why Jesus said I think it's John 5 
All that in their graves will hear, their, hear my voice and come forth. They that have done good into the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So when Christ comes, he's going he's to conquer death for the whole human race. But the wicked, when they're resurrected, they'll be judged and they'll be cast into the lake of fire for eternal punishment. But Christ will destroy the last enemy. And in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Sure. They were disembodied. They were disembodied souls. His presence is in Hades, so to speak. And you, you remember the, the scripture that was read? It says in Revelation chapter six, they were under the altar. They were under the altar. It's not till later on in the book of Revelation, after the judgment, that they're in full fellowship with God. So God's presence is there. No, don't explain me how, how to explain it. Don't ask me how to explain that. That's Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God. I can't explain it. His presence is there. Because Paul said when he died, he's going to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Well... According to the other teaching, he didn't depart and die and go to heaven. He went to paradise. So his presence is there, but it's described as a state of being unclothed. We're incomplete. We're resting, but we're incomplete. God created us to be soul and body. That's why he created Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. Compound being. When we die, the body goes to the ground. Our soul exists, but we're naked. Spiritually speaking. And the resurrection will be reclothed with glory. Just like Christ was reclothed with his body. Then we'll be in heaven. But, right. A lot of, yeah, a lot of denominational teaching, they'll, they'll, they'll talk of Hades as being the place of torment, but that's not the, yeah, that's not the whole story of it. But uh, <clears throat> back to our text, and that's a good lesson that we'll do, we'll do some, some time uh, in the future. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> back to uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16. We just got a moment to talk about this. For where there is a testament, and I said before, testament and covenant, same word in Greek. Where there is a testament, there must also be the necessity of, Necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in no force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. And it talks about how those things were dedicated with the blood of animals, which we'll, we'll get into too, too deeper next week, Lord willing. No, I won't be here next week, will I? Mike Demery is supposed to come, right. Mike Demery is supposed to come and give a report uh, next week. I will be here, but he's going to preach and give a report on his work that we support up in Dubuque. Let me say this about verse 16 and 17. The testament is not enforced while the person lives. You have a will. It's not enforced until you die. But while you are living, you can parcel out whatever you want in that will. And this answers the whole, what about the thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized, therefore I don't have to be baptized argument. Jesus could parcel out forgiveness to anyone who was a penitent believer while he was alive because Jesus forgave the thief before Jesus died. And when Jesus died, he brought about the new covenant. I can't be saved like the thief was. The thief is an example of who can be saved, not how to be saved. I am saved. Everyone is saved today the same way that you find in the book of Acts. That's after Christ died, after people were under the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Therefore, there was no way on earth that the thief on the cross could be baptized with New Testament baptism because the New Testament did not come into effect until Jesus died. 
Besides all that, there is most likely uh, a lot of evidence that he was baptized by John's baptism before he became a thief and was being punished for it. So <clears throat> understanding the covenant in these two verses here, Hebrews 9, verse 16 and 17, helps us to understand the argument that's made about the thief on the cross. A testament is not enforced until the testator dies. We are under the New Testament today. Much more to be said about that, and we'll take up our lesson the next time we have class.